Cat from FullMetalRock.com. We are speaking with Jason Aragoni from Half Past My Sin. Have a new album coming out, or is out already. Tell us about that album, Jason. Well, the uh, album is called 444, and uh, it came out at the end of May, uh, May 20th of uh, this year. And uh, it's basically a record about the day in a life of a, of a uh, basically a relationship that ended. And uh, some great players are on it. <clears throat> and, you know, it's just a good hard rock record, and I'm really proud of it. And it really is the best work that I've done in my career as a, as a vocalist. It is an awesome album, I have to say. Um, my Demand was the first uh, single off that album? Yeah, My Demand actually, My Demand was done last summer, and we put it out as a single, and we did a small campaign with skateboard marketing out of New York City. And it, it got really good, uh, it got really good reviews. People seem to really dig this brand of hard rock. You know, we're melodic, but we have aggressive beats. I think, we're, you know, you kind of throw in a little bit of seven dust, a little bit of disturbed, a little bit of stabbing westward kind of feel in there and just kind of throw it all together and mix it in. And that's kind of what we are. Uh, we're a melodic hard rock band. Um, but that tune came about, it was the last tune that was actually done for the record with my songwriting partner, Dan Gavril, who he and I have been working together for about 12 years now. And uh, we basically, you know, would write the music together, <clears throat> and I didn't really have a lot of ideas for it. So when Clint Lowry came on board, that was the first song I shot to him. I said, "Hey, you know, let's take a listen to this and see what you come up with." And, and Clint came came back with some really good ideas. And it, it, at that time, I was kind of going through a writer's block kind of thing, and I just couldn't, you know, get anything out of my pen. And when Clint came on board, it really shook things up. He, you know, he gave me a burst to work with, and then all of a sudden, we just had this really great song, and uh, yeah, that uh, opened the floodgates. Basically, we ended up writing. He, he came in and co-wrote five tunes with us. I mean, the music was already done, and a lot of the lyrics and melodies were already there, and then he just kind of shaped them and molded them into what Clint does. He's a great songwriter, and he helped elevate the tunes, which. You know, I'm very grateful to have been a part of this record. Uh, so that song came out, and that was kind of everybody's choices. The producer, Joey Z, I'm a mix engineer, he uh, he's like, I really like my demand. And you know, that's what the radio promotion team thought. And so we kind of went with that. And it did well. You know, we did well in a few of the uh, cage matches. And uh, Music Choice had picked it up and put it in rotation. Sirius played it a couple times, I think like four times on Octane. Um, you know, but it was a smaller campaign, so hopefully the crunch, which is the new single, will be able to uh, <clears throat> radio contraband out of Seattle, Washington, is handling this uh, campaign. They're going to uh, do a three-month campaign with Crutch, and I, I think that this song is a little bit more aggressive than my demand. It's got a little bit different feel, but uh, it definitely will be fine what this band is, and I think it's a great introduction to a lot of these secondary markets that haven't heard of Half Past My Sin. I mean, we're a virtually new band, even though we've been around for, you know, five, six years now. Yeah, and, and this is your soft, sophomore attempt, right? Yeah, yeah, which, you know, the first record, very solid record. We didn't have, you know, we used program drums for that record, and it, it just was a really cool record, but it kind of had this industrial feel to it, which wasn't giving the record uh, justice. Um, so when we were on tour in 2008 with, with uh, the Dreaming, you know, going across the country, people would, would buy the record and they would email us. Oh, you guys are really super good live, but the record doesn't sound anything like you guys live because it's just you were so raw and powerful live. You, we didn't capture that on that first record, and and you know we worked with an engineer that was in our genre of music, which I think you know looking back, hindsight's always 2020. But now we're actually going back in the studio we're sneaking into the studio at the end of october to retrack all the drums with jason bittner once again uh so we're actually going to re-release that record early next year uh you know and it's just going to be for me it's one of those things where i i would i'm so excited to be able to put live drums and you know put some new parts into these songs and make them just as good as this new record that just came out because this new record that just came out i think is from start to finish, it's a really strong record. Very, uh, there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of dynamics, and so 
I really like the fact that we did both produce this record, and I think that it gives them, you know, you're going to listen to it, and it may take a couple times to get used to it because it doesn't sound like a Breaking Benjamin record. I'm thinking while you're talking um, that how how I get disappointed if I go to a show where an album's been overproduced, expecting to hear that same exact sound, and you don't get anything mm-hmm. close to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you, you, you want to be able to reproduce what you create in the studio. And that, for me, is very important. You know, when, when you're doing recording, you should always keep that in mind. And you know, when, when we would do comp tracks of the vocals, you know, you sit with it for a day or two, and you go home and you practice it and make sure that you can sing it. Because that's how music is made today. With Pro Tools, it's just so easy to copy and paste everything. And for me, I wouldn't, I didn't allow that. Every chorus on this record was sung individually. Every verse was sung individually. You know, there's no copy and paste. And we'll sing it once and we'll paste it for the rest of the record. You know, you just do what you do and do it well. And hopefully people will get on board and they will like what you do. They will connect with it. And that's the biggest thing for me. It's just if you're connecting to what I've written and how I'm performing it, for me, that's success. And it doesn't matter if I sell one record or a million records. If that one person in the audience or that one person that buys it gets what I'm trying to do. So you prefer, you prefer more of the um, live performance or do you like recording better? I, I know you, um, I don't know if you're uh, the I, I mean, with the Mohawk yeah. Recording Group. Do you do a lot of... Uh, Different bands in the um, studio. I, I, you know, I started when I started this record label. I did a couple bands up in, in, in the New England area, and it just wasn't fun for me. It didn't, it didn't to watch like somebody it. else do it. <laughs> yeah, to watch somebody else do it because I was, you know, you start to, you know, the producer or or somebody that I guess I, I was working as a producer. We had an engineer, and I don't really know much about engineering. And I mean, I didn't go to college for that. I went to college for the business side of music and. and vocal performance side of music uh, but as a songwriter you start to produce things and I worked with a, a punk rock band who you know were a three piece and it was torture for me to sit there and not be able to perform or play and you know you're giving them ideas and they kind of look at you like you don't really want to like that idea or you know not trying it so for me it's, it's more I'd rather be live playing and out live I love writing my own music I love creating it but for me, I was built for the stage. I mean, I started performing live when I was, I don't know, sixth, seventh grade, and that was that was it. I mean, once you get a taste of that, you, you are know, definitely you, a born front man for sure. Uh, well, a few videos, and I'm that. like, man, he's pretty awesome as a front man. But I do appreciate that. Part of the reason why I'm doing this radio campaign is to test the market, to see what cities are into this. And, and where we're going to target our touring. And so at the end of October, we'll sit down and we'll start mapping out two or three week runs at a time and we'll do smaller tours and we'll do them self finance. So, you know, we're not going in already in the red. You know, we have a chance to make a little bit of money. Uh, so, you know, you have to sustain yourself out there. It's cost a lot of money to be on the road for gas, food, lodging. Equipment break down. And those are things that people don't think about with bands. No, no. I don't don't think bands think about that so much. I don't think bands think about that so much. Um, You know, when we did a run with Dreaming, it was awesome because it wasn't, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, we'd walk into a club and and you didn't know that you had a guarantee coming. It was a very disorganized tour to be on, in, in my opinion. I learned a lot on that tour. I said, you know, I, I really love playing with that band. They're, they're so good live every night. And, you know, to be a part of that tour. Chris Hall was one of my, you know, I guess, influences in the 90s. I mean, I love stabbing Westward and to be able to you know, hang with those guys on a nightly basis and, you know, think they're, you know, just pick their ba- brains for information. And how do you do that? I mean, so that song, what were you doing in that tune? And that's the, you know, so you try to learn from these guys because they've been doing it way longer than you have. And you just go out there and give it 100%. And by any, by no means, the, the Dreaming and Half Past My Sin are totally two different styles of hard rock music. But we were able to close the gap every night and bring that crowd closer. You know, and that was, that was the great thing is that the fans really dug what we were doing. And 
uh, I think they were happy to have a band that cared about what they sounded like and what they looked like. They, you know, we worked hard for that. And so, you know, when we start touring again, it's going to be in places that maybe bigger bands don't go. Uh, you don't have to play every major city. There's a lot of secondary markets out there. There's a lot of smaller cities that deserve a hard rock show. And I'm willing to do that. I love going to uh, the machine shop in Flint, Michigan, to see a band because it's a smaller venue. And I love seeing bands that close because you can really feel the music and not just go to a show, big arena, you know, barely see the guitar player. I don't like that. I I much prefer an intimate, closer setting. I would rather see that than go to a huge arena. You know what I'm saying? I mean, as a fan. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, Seven Dust is one of those bands that, you know, they have so much energy and it's just, it's weird how this, this band, just, and we just, I just connected to these guys when they first came out. I think it was in 1998. I think Home was the new record, and they were out in Minneapolis, and I went and saw them in, in the First Avenue nightclub when I was in college. I went out, and I guess in that spring, they were on the Tattoo the Earth tour, and I had uh, passes from 93X out in Minneapolis, and you know, I talked with Jean, and it was then to come kind of full circle all this time later to be working with Clint and, and getting to know these guys and, um, you know, leaning up with them at NAM and hanging out with them for a couple of days and just learning all their, you know, all their hardships that they went through and giving you some advice and, hey, just go tour, man. And, you know, don't do that. Don't do this. And, you know, see what's good for you. So those are, you know, those guys are just great guys and so down to earth. And I got to be honest, if, if everybody was, if everybody in this business were like those guys, this would be such a better business. Be mm. You know, they are they are great guys and they work hard. And uh, you know, in my opinion, they're one of the best hard rock bands that ever was assembled, especially in this genre of music. I mean, I think they're so solid. I don't think they've ever put out a, a, a weak record. Uh, you know, and so uh, I mean, that's if I can have you know as much. Success, success with those guys, I would be completely satisfied. Where do you think you're going to be in the next five years? Well, I'll hopefully still be in music. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm going to take it day by day. You know, I don't like to think that far ahead, but, you know, I'd like to think that, you know, I'll put out this record, this reissue of the first record next year, and I'm going to be doing a five song EP, cover EP. Uh, next year as well that is already being in pre-production while we're kind of waiting to put together the live game. So I like to be, you know, touring on a, on a regular basis uh, within the next 24 months and, uh, you know, putting out a full-length album after these two uh, studio things are done. And uh, you know, take it from there. Speaking of that, as far as being on tour, um, I'm assuming Dan, would be with you on that. Right, would Jason Bittner and Ben Carroll also join you with that tour? Or would um, you have Dan, uh, Jason came about, Jason and Ben came about my frustration of working with musicians that just couldn't get their um, act together, you know, dealing with alcoholics or drug addicts or people that don't show up. You know, I'm very, for me, it's, it's very important to be focused and, it, it, it has to be run like a business, but you also need to have fun at it. But when you're putting thousands of dollars and tons of time into a, a band, you have to, you know, be accountable for things. Um, so for me, it was, you know, it was like I met Jason at a club one night. We ran into each other again. We had a mutual friend. And I kind of, you know, basically just kept on nudging him until he said, hey, yeah, I'll I'll listen to your stuff. I'll play on this record. Um, and then Ben Carroll came on board. I had played a couple shows with Rob, and that's how I met Ben. And I, said, I sent him a couple of demos, and I said, hey, man, what do you think? You think that you might want to come and play with this? Um, and so that's how Ben came about. Dan and I have been together for a long time. Um, I'm not sure, you know, if all three of these guys will be on the road. I don't think Ben will play a lot of those. I think he's going on to different things in his life. and. Uh, you know, with the ending of Raw touring, I don't think it's in the cards for him to come in and play in Half Past My Sin on the road, but stranger things have happened. Uh, Jason, uh, you know, he's he's very busy with his new project, uh, New Band Toxic. 
I know that the new big modern record coming, uh, but then again, you know, Shadow's Fall just kind of announced that they're kind of taking a break. So Jason's a, possi- a, a big possibility to do some short runs with us. Um, we have his drum tech, Brian Zink, filling in for him right now. So Jason is definitely um, somebody that could be seen playing with us live. And Dan, I would imagine that uh, he would be there too, but you know, that's really up to him. He does have a family and uh, has another career, so that's really something that he would have to you know, answer. And unfortunately, I can't give you that answer. But I would love to see him all four of them play live with me, but for all three of them play live with me, but you know, that may not ever happen you know, at the same time. Right. So, uh, listen, um, we've got to wrap this up. Is there anything you'd like to uh, tell your fans? You said that you have um, that market um, thing coming up. When does that start now? Uh, well, the uh, radio campaign starts September 1st, I believe, so it's probably Tuesday or September 2nd. Um, you know, we have, we have a full online store with, with a brand new record with a, a deluxe edition with a cover of Alice Cooper's Billion Dollar Baby. Um, they can you know, go to halfpastmysin.com and get all that information. Uh, they can stream uh, Crutch uh, at that site. They can get a free download by going halfpastmysin.com forward slash download. Uh, they can get my demand for free and sign up for the email list and get a discount code. So, you know, if you want to be introduced to Half Past My Sin, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for you to do that. And we know you work hard for your money, you know, so... When you're buying that nine dollar CD on iTunes or wherever you choose to buy it, uh, you know we we know you work hard. We try to give you a quality product, and you know we're just hoping to get some traction here with the team so we can get out there live and bring a real rock show to everybody. So that's well, kind of you know. I totally look forward to seeing you live. I hope you come somewhere in Detroit so that can happen. And uh, on behalf of uh, FullMetalRock.com. I want to thank you very much for your time, and we wish you the best in the future moving forward with the band, the tour, any new stuff that you do. Thank you so much, Jason. You know, we appreciate it, and thank you for the time today. All right, you take care. You too. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.